Hello, good morning and good afternoon. I'm Alina Polyakova and welcome to the SIPA Fireside Chat with France's Ambassador for Digital Affairs, Ambassador Henri Verdier. I'm Alina Polyakova. I'm President and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis, coming to you as always from Washington, DC. It's really my pleasure to have you with us today, Ambassador, and to have everyone who's tuning in into this, what is going to be a really interesting and exciting conversation. This discussion is part of SEPA's Digital Innovation Initiative, which advances transatlantic cooperation on technology policy. Ambassador, many thanks for taking the time. It's so great to finally meet you, even though it's uh, virtually. Hopefully, we'll get the chance to meet in person soon. Uh, just a quick word about Ambassador Verdier. Uh, Ambassador uh, was appointed in 2018 by President Macron to his current role. But before that, of course, uh, he served in several governmental positions, including as the Interministerial Director for DG Dinsink and Director of Etalab, the French Agency for Public Open Data. And Ambassador, I know that you yourself come from the tech sector, where you headed a startup among other ventures. And I know that gives you a very unique perspective on into the issues we'll be discussing today. Of course, France's presidency of the Council of the European Union is top of mind, and digital issues are high on the priority list for your country. So without further ado, let's just get right in there. So Ambassador, let me kick it off with uh, a big question for you. Uh, for a long time, France has advocated for more European and French autonomy in the digital do domain. And this idea of digital sovereignty uh, has become a bit politically loaded because autocratic governments uh, use a version of this term as well to mean obviously very, very different things than what the French mean or any other democratic government means. So let me kick it off and ask you, what does digital sovereignty mean to you? What does it mean for France? So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to exchange with you. I always like to exchange with the U.S. friends. As it maybe we'll have time to, to say it, uh, we will see that, in fact, the history of Internet is a transatlantic history and that Europe did invent and develop most of the open standards of Internet, like uh, the web itself, uh, Linux, uh, Bluetooth, uh, etc. So we did Sometimes in Silicon Valley, they forget it, but we did invent this together, and I feel that we have to, to, to de define the, the next step together. And you're completely right. Um, France advocates for a long time for European digital sovereignty, and this word is a, maybe a complex word, and some authoritarian regime use the same word, but not the same signification, and it's time to be very precise. Uh, yes, some authoritarian regimes speaks about sovereignty to say more or less that the state do what it wants in international relation. So, and the state, not the society or the country, but the state. Um, it's absolutely not the French vision, and we are not speaking about. So, we are not speaking about the right for the state to do anything. We are not speaking neither about the state controlling internet. We are speaking about being free within internet. We are speaking about strategic autonomy. Uh, and I want to add between two great democracies that in France, we, we, we link sovereignty to democracy. If we want the people to be sovereign, and that's our constitutions, <laughs> we need states able to implement its decisions or the state, the people is not sovereign without the state strong enough and autonomous enough to, to implement what we, the people, we decide. Um, so that's very important for democracies to, to build and to share a vision of a, a sovereignty uh, linked to democracy itself. And personal autonomy and collective uh, autonomy are connected here. So to, to give you time for the next question, that's why you are trying to explain to Europe. It's not about controlling internet. It's not about protectionism. It's not about hegemony. 
it's just the fact that we, we need to be autonomous, to be able, for example, to take proper decision about privacy. And we cannot afford a world where huge big companies say, oh, I don't like your regulation, I won't implement them. <laughs> Uh, we need to be able to, if needed, to host our data on, on on platforms that does respect our legislation. So maybe because of, the, and I'm sure we'll speak a bit about this, because of this temptation to take uh, inter extraterritorial regulation, we will need to be able to host some data in Europe to be sure that we will respect European legislation. And so we need uh, industry, because uh, if you want to build things in Europe, you need your own industry. But it's all about autonomy. And just to conclude, next week, no, not next week, the 7th of February, we host a European um, meeting about European digital sovereignty in the framework of the French presidency of the EU. So we do invite the 27 uh, ministries of uh, Ministers of Foreign Affairs and the 27 Minister of uh, Economic Affairs. And the framework we'll share with our friends is a, a four step uh, framework. Because, first, and some people tend to, to, forget, to, to forget this, first, sovereignty starts with security. That's simple, that if everyone can spy you or disconnect you, you are not free. <laughs> so, cybersecurity, uh, state behavior regulation, international law, what we do together in a very like-minded approach in the United Nations is very important. The proper capacities of Europe to protect itself also. The second point is that, yes, in this economy, if you don't create, if we don't innovate, you, you are not the leader because we know it takes all. So yes, we need a better uh, digital economy, more startups, more uh, more unicorns, uh, and that's very important. So we will continue to encourage, to finance, to, to fight to have a real creative ecosystem. The third point is that, and probably we'll speak about this, yes, we need uh, to encourage a shared framework about companies' regulation. And here, we have two sets of rules in Europe and uh, in the uh, US, and we, it's time to exchange and to see if we can find some convergences. And the last point may, may surprise you. Of course, in the digital economy, the owner of the resources you, you, you are using is the boss. Platforms are king. <laughs> uh, so, so we could uh, try to have a proper monopolies, but that's not the way Europe will, uh, will use. We will, and that's new, we'll encourage um, and maybe finance, and maybe with a European initiative, digital commons. Mm -hmm. In fact, we consider that the more we have things like Linux and all the open uh, free software uh, movements, open data, big contributive common like uh, Wikipedia or uh, OpenStreetMap, the more free we are. And that's very interesting because here you can see that we can imagine a shared sovereignty, a non-rival sovereignty. Because the more we have digital commons, it's not hegemony, it's not against someone. <laughs> I can be more autonomous and Germany also, and Europe also, and US also, and Africa also, with more commons, with more things in, in common. So that will be a very important aspect of the, the European approach of uh, sovereignty. So, Ambassador, let me follow up because you already uh, laid out quite uh, an expansive vision here. And I, I just want to drill down on some of the things you already mentioned. Uh, so, if I understand you correctly, the main element of sovereignty, whether it be in the digital domain, the security domain, or strategic autonomy, which, of course, is the, the large concept for uh, Europe's ability to make decisions about its future in the world and what that really means. Uh, if decision making is really the key, uh, that is very much, I think, something that any sovereign state wants to have in its security policy, its digital policy across the board. But you also mentioned that in the digital domain, they may include things like, uh, you know, national or national level cloud services, for example, data protection. And I think the question that often comes up is, 
is the vision of sovereignty in the digital domain really compatible with the importance of having the open access model to data in particular? Because once, for example, once we start having so many different cloud services, for example, um, is it going to make it more difficult to actually have free open data flows across European countries, across the Atlantic? We obviously have a real challenge with data flows across the Atlantic right now uh, with the ongoing conversations and negotiations around the privacy shield question and what that's going to mean for the future. So how do you see these two things, you know, one well, data protection you. and open access to data uh, really working together in the way that you envision? Thank you for your question. That's a very important question. You are at the heart of the question of the problem. And something that some authoritarian regimes don't understand. Uh, if I may, here uh, I will share with you uh, our vision, our French vision, very simple. Probably you will agree with this. But a lot of people make a confusion between three things, maybe three layers. So to be to make it simple, in 1917, we did invent internet more in the Silicon Valley. So internet is a network of computer. And here, it's a unique, open, free, neutral network for, for humanity with a quite a multi-stakeholder governance under the species of UN. And it does work. And we have to protect and maybe today to fight for this free and open internet. In 1919, uh, in Europe, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, British guy, <laughs> did invent the web. The web is different than internet. It's something over internet. With the web, we had the user-generated content, and we had to fix some issues like child abuse content, terrorist content, hate, etc. And we did ad adopt some regulation. But basically, in US and in Europe, we decided that the hosting services are not in charge of the content, and that uh, they just have to to cooperate with law enforcement, basically. But we had quite the same regulation. And in 2004, in, in Harvard, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and then in 2005, in, in Los Angeles, uh, YouTube, and in 2006, in San Francisco, Twitter, was something new. They are companies with a private law, in terms of services, and with a dedicated business model and with a completely different architecture. Internet is neutral, decentralized, free, open. A social network is not neutral. They curate and promote some content with algorithm. It's not open. I cannot add my own services freely. I cannot observe and analyze the, the algorithm. It's not uh, open, neither. Um, and yes, that, that's probably a mistake we made everywhere. <laughs> even in Europe, because at the beginning, we, we did consider them as a part of internet, and they are not a part of internet, they are something built on internet. And now probably one of the most important part of the conversation between Europe and US is that we in Europe, we consider that they are companies, and we have to regulate them. <laughs> and uh, we don't care. In fact, my my mission is not to prepare a unique uni united market for Facebook. Uh, if they have a united market, great, but that's not my mission. <laughs> so, and we have to protect the unique and shared internet and to regulate the companies. And I I'm coming to your point. The unique open and free internet is the, the most important asset for humanity and for peace because we, with this interdependency, we, no one considered to attack the internet of the other country. If China wants to disconnect the US internet, they will disconnect the Chinese internet, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, so that's very important. And uh, but concerning data and especially business model, we can discuss. There is no need for a unique market in the world. Probably it's better, but it's not a fundamental right. And for example, in Europe, we consider privacy as a very important issue. Uh, well, I we think, I think that's... Uh, you know, sorry, I, I give you the floor, but 
when I did visit some campaign team during your election, and when I did discover the huge database about every American voter with 200 information about each of you, and I can know that you have a, a driving license and you have a gun and your children are in a private school and blah, blah. For Europe, Europe that's impossible. We, we could not agree at no point with this vision of this kind of use of the personal data. So here, if we can have a convergence, it will be great, but maybe we won't converge, I don't know. Well, Ambassador, I think we can all agree, most likely, I would hope, that uh, we we want an open, free, and interoperable internet as the dominant model. I think, unfortunately, we already are in a reality where countries like China are working uh, very hard for a very long time now to basically have a different version of the internet. And we know that the internet looks very different uh, to Chinese citizens than it does to European or American citizens. And we're seeing similar models emerge uh, that focus on internet and data controls in countries like Russia, of course, and, and elsewhere. Um, so in many ways, authoritarian states see data, they see the internet space, the digital domain um, as a tool for control. Um, and of course, on our side, on the democratic side uh, of the world, uh, we need to have alignment, need to have unity around what we can do to ensure that there is a remaining space for a democratic and open internet, which is, I agree with you, a fundamental right these days. Um, but let me just uh, you know, switch gears a little bit, but also mention that- Can I just make a two finger comment here because that's okay. very important. Yes, of course, the digital space in China is completely different with different rules, et cetera and we dislike this approach. But it's the same technical internet so far. Yes. It's the same TCP IP protocol, it's the same Huawei or Cisco equipments, it's the same, um, and we are interconnected. It may change, and it, it, it would be worse than anything you can imagine. So it's, a different, it's two separate digital spaces, and that's sad, but it's the same technical infrastructure that's right. so far. Exactly, exactly. Um, so let me let me follow up on, on something you said and take us to a slightly different angle to this discussion. Uh, as, as you, of course, are aware, there's uh, quite um, expansive and growing discussions and debates on technology regulation here in Washington, the United States as well, a lot of them focusing on competition policy and regulation. You know, at the same time, at the EU level, there are quite significant uh, legislative proposals on the table, including Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. Uh, so all of these things are moving forward um, at different paces in the United States, in Europe, and then at the level of European uh, member states, uh, EU member states as well. But I think one of the things you mentioned is, one, yes, I think there's transatlantic agreement that the so-called digital domain needs some guardrails, that we need to have some regulatory provisions because this industry hasn't had any for a very long time. And we need to be thinking about the public good when we when we talk about regulation. Well, one thing you also mentioned is the need for providing a environment for innovation, right? Because it's one thing to say there are some companies that have perhaps gone too big and we should think about guardrails in that space that, that address these particular concerns around competition. But how do we at the same time prioritize innovation? Because we're not going to add compete uh, the growing tech industry in China or elsewhere if we're not also encouraging innovation. I know that that is one of the core priorities uh, for the French presidency uh, of the Council of the EU to promote tech innovation, especially in the fields of cloud computing and semiconductors, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, you call the essential building blocks for competitive economy. So I want to get you to talk a little bit more about what, you know, what principles, what specifics uh, is the French government planning to pursue to ensure European competitiveness, especially in these critical technologies? Hmm. So you, you did cross a lot of very important topics in a small, uh, small piece of words. Um, I could discuss about quite all your, your assumption. Uh, I will recognize with you that we that uh, the multiplication of a text claiming extraterritorial application would be a, a bad thing, and it would be better to build a, a shared uh, space of uh, common framework 
but maybe you did start <laughs> with uh, some regulation. So it's time to, and we did the answer. So it's time to to, to exchange. And for example, the Transatlantic Tech Council launched by US and EU um, or smallest initiative like the Global Partnership for AI launched by France, but with the US are very important places. Then, um, as you said, you, we need um, innovation stronger and stronger. But if I may, the need for innovation don't, is not automatically a need for uh, big monopolistic companies. <laughs> uh, you, as I did mention, we could also encourage more diversity, more uh, place for commons, uh, more things we share together, uh, more resources for small companies. Uh, and probably in Europe, we, we like this also this part of the innovation stream. So civil society, uh, non-governmental organization, uh, et cetera. That's, uh, I don't know, I don't want to accuse anyone, but some of those very big companies, I don't know if they did offer to us very important things for the last 10 years. So we need more diversity, more innovation everywhere. But yes, uh, we in Europe and in France, uh, we need a champion. I don't say I don't know if you say champion. We yep. need uh, uh, fast-growing companies. We need uh, disruptive innovation. We need, uh, and we started for few years. Um, for example, when President Macron was elected, we had in France three unicorns. You know, a unicorn is a company that was one billion dollars after less than three or four years. Now we have 25 unicorns. So this question, we, we did fix it. <laughs> so now we, we want this unicorn to go to the IPO and to become big international companies, but with uh, all kinds of um, new industrial policies, because of course it's not about giving money to the companies themselves, but it's about encouraging innovative ecosystem, closer cooperation between universities and uh, companies and between small and big companies, uh, um, responsible uh, by policies from the government, etc. We can design an ecosystem. And Europe is very engaged to be, definitively, we, we, we don't want, uh, we, we want a, a seat as a co-driver of the revolution, not in the passenger <laughs> seat. And for this, we need companies and great companies. Uh, but I, uh, or I speak one hour, or I conclude here. We do inject money, public policies, and we definitely want to be creative. And sometimes, some people in Europe say half joking that uh, US invent uh, China copy and uh, Europe regulate. So first, as I told you, sometimes Europe invents too, but we do explain to everyone in Europe that if you don't create, you won't regulate because this is a story of de facto standards. And That's right. We know like all. That's right. I think, you know, as you know, there's been you know growing transatlantic cooperation on the regulatory side as well, because we are talking about primarily American companies here. And many would argue that it should be up to the US government to regulate American companies, not up to any government uh, to, to impose the kind of competition rules or content regulation rules or whatever have you, um, you know, in, in the tech sector, because we are talking about large US companies that do have large market shares um, in multiple international, um, international markets as well. And I think the TTC is one place where we have seen growing cooperation between Europe and the United States. Um, I know that uh, France is uh, keen to host the next meeting of the TTC as well, the the, tech and, the Trade and, and Technology Council that the United States uh, kicked off for a meeting in Pittsburgh last year. So my final question to you, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, the, fr the French vision for sovereignty, uh, how France uh, plans to uh, invest and encourage European investment innovation. But I wanted to, to close us off with a, with a broader question about uh, the opportunities for transatlantic uh, cooperation on on technology and more broadly in a digital agenda. You know, as we have you know, multiple policies taking shape across the Atlantic, 
certainly at the level of the European Commission, certainly in France, Germany, elsewhere, and in Washington, um, how do we make sure that we uh, are united on our approach and that we don't end up uh, with a fragmented uh, policy sector where it's very difficult to know what companies, big or small, uh, should really be doing? So what are the opportunities for greater cooperation to ensure that we're more aligned rather than divided on these issues? I think that uh, the opportunity is great. So first, probably you did recognize, maybe after January the 6th, that it's time for some kind of regulation. And we did understand that uh, we won't be sovereign without uh, real uh, big companies. So we did start a kind of convergence, and it's time uh, for discussion. Then after the, the Biden administration, U US is coming back in the multilateral uh, process. So we are everywhere together, and we meet, and we exchange, and we make progresses uh, in the United Nations, in the OECD, OEC, everywhere. So that's important too. And then we have some first uh, places to exchange, like the TTC. Uh, those last weeks and months, some people start to speak about um, discussing about the next revolutions. And probably it would be a good idea because it's, it's more easy to start thinking um, on a cold matter, if I may, <laughs> um, about next issues when we don't have so far proper regulations. So about uh, web 3.0 about uh, quantum computing, about uh, emerging uh, technologies like this, it's, we don't have regulation, nor in Europe, neither in the US. It's more easy to start uh, quietly uh, to discuss and to find common principles, because it's not so difficult. You know, uh, when I travel in the US, I discover that some Americans tend to, to ignore that you did uh, regulate a lot. Deregulation is not so everywhere in the world, the last 13 years were, were uh, 30 years were about more about deregulation. But for example, just to conclude with this, I will publish in France in, the, in two weeks a book about, called in, Entitled The Business of Hate internet democracy and social network. But I do explain how important was the fairness doctrine. You did adopt this, if I'm correct, in uh, 1943. <laughs> how smart it was. I do comment the, the brilliant uh, decision of your Supreme Court concerning the relation between uh, the First Amendment and the, 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 the Fairness Doctrine and the Supreme Court in 1963 decided that the First Amendment was to protect the democracy and that the right for a citizen to have a variety of information was more important than the right for a company to say whatever it wants. <laughs> so I do comment precisely this, uh, this decision. So you have a long tradition of uh, brilliant regulation, uh, and we can ex exchange deeply about this. And, uh, but probably, and probably it's time we need this, or we will maybe have big companies, but we will lose the democracy itself. That's a very good point. Of course, the Fairness Doctrine, I believe, was uh, abolished in the late 1980s in the United States. Yes, and been in uh, 1986, 86, and Fox News was yes. printed in 1988. <laughs> exactly. And so there have been a lot of uh, now conversations about whether that should be something we bring back now that we have a, a quite robust digital media. And back in those days, of course, we we're really talking about traditional media. Um, but okay, I think... I think Sorry, I think we, we need a fairness doctrine for algorithm, which is difficult to implement, but the principle can be clear. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we can talk. That's a whole other conversation about uh, balance, fairness, and bias in, in artificial intelligence and algorithms. That's, um, I, I, we can have a follow-up conversation, if you like, on that topic. I'd be very glad to do so. Well. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ambassador, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know there's a lot more we could have discussed. Um, there's a lot on, on the digital agenda. I look forward uh, to seeing the, uh, the summit 
on the di on digital issues that France will host in the weeks ahead and what uh, we can see as the outcomes of that. And we'll be following very, very closely, of course, uh, the priorities uh, that Paris has uh, laid out for the for the presidency uh, of the of the European Union. And thank you very much for giving us a sense of the French perspective on these issues um, and hope to have you back again. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation.